Before we get started, I'm going to need to tell you a little story. This year it's not fly fishing though, but I promise you're still going to love it. This is the story about how I became an 11-year-old Avon lady. Now, I'd gotten the idea from a note card that was pinned to a bulletin board in the laundry room of the apartment building that I lived in with my mom. A woman named Renee was moving, and she was actually our Avon lady, and she wanted to pass on the business to somebody else. And when I talked to her, it seemed pretty straightforward because she already had all the stuff. There were supplies and bags and sales books and, and all that kind of samples, which were really important, and the brochures came every month. And it seemed like you could just call the company and make a little switch. And so I ran my, nominally ran my plan by my mom, who was busy and cool, and it's like, yeah, what could go wrong? And so off I went. So I need to provide a little context for you first. This was the 1970s. This was a very, very dark time for beauty. There was no Instagram. There was no YouTube. There were no videos to show you how to do all the things. There were women magazines. They were made of paper, I'm sorry to say. The Postal Service would bring the magazines to you if you wanted them, but if you really wanted to do a deep dive into how to do the kinds of stuff that women wanted to do, you typically had to go to the, the, the newsstand and like get a bunch of them and look at them, which was frowned upon typically, but people still did it. And when you think about beauty products at the time, if you actually wanted to get good, even affordable products, you had to get in your car and go to the mall. You, the, the CVS, all the drugstores, pretty much only had baby aspirin, and the Piggly Wiggly pretty much only had lettuce. Those were, those were basically our options at the time. It was a dark time, and that's all we had. So um, if you liked the products and you were on a budget, your Avon lady was kind of an important person in your life. You wanted the samples that she had. You wanted the tips that she could share with you. And what you really wanted, especially if you wanted on, or on a budget wanted to look good, you wanted the discounts that she could provide. But I hadn't thought about any of that when I started this plan because I was an actual child. I was 11. I had to climb on the washing machine to get the card down to even just start my, launch my plan. And I know that 11 and 12 year olds are launching climate change movements that are brand ambassadors <laughs> and stuff, like doing amazing things. But when I wasn't doing homework and when I wasn't delivering Avon, I was playing in a tree fort in the woods in the, behind my house. You know, that was sort of the level of expertise I was bringing to this. I didn't have any makeup tips. I don't have any makeup tips now. <laughs> but, and this is where it gets really interesting, we needed the money and we needed it badly. This particular apartment complex uh, was on the sort of low rent working class side of a very pretty shoreline town in Connecticut called Branford and it was no one's forever home. Some people were there because they were starting out, you know, their first jobs out of high school or college and their families and starting families and they were saving money. But plenty of us, and I would suggest most of us, were there because life had knocked us back a peg or two or six. And that was my mom and me. We were hanging on by a thread. A couple of years prior, we had escaped our Harlem apartment in the middle of the night, escaping a decade's worth of violence. And then we were adrift unmoored, bunking in with, staying with, and it took about a year before she finally found a job and then got a promotion. And then we got an apartment and an Elon lady. We had um, only hand-me-down and goodwill clothes and, and uh, furniture, but we were safe. Now, I not only was the only black kid in this six building complex, I was the only black person. A couple of my neighbors, not many, but would casually use the N-word in conversation. Some of my neighbors, not many, would occasionally use the word Jew as a verb. Everybody, inexplicably, was obsessed with Leonard Skinner. I do not know why. <laughs> and while plenty of my customers just wanted their skin so soft delivered every month, which I did, there were plenty of women there who understood what I was actually trying to do, because they were trying to do it too. So they invited me in, and they we shared their tips with me, and they took my samples, and they helped me grow my business. And they looked the other way when I delivered their supplies every month in the little red wagon that I had borrowed from a kid down the hall. Now, sisters and siblings, I promise you, for the next two years, I made serious whip, for a kid anyway, selling Avon to this crew. I could finally afford new clothes. I could fi finally afford shoes. I could finally afford all the, sp the school supplies I wanted, and what no one ever tells you is how to, what to expect when you become suddenly poor. 
I could, I could afford business, um, birthday and Christmas presents. It's like the most humiliating part of not having any money is that you can't even do something nice for the people that you love. Now, these women, many of them looked like, and in some cases were, the moms of the kinds of kids that made the sanctuary of the black kids' table at the, in, the, in the school cafeteria necessary for me. And yet, they saved me. And I promise you, if they were here, they would tell you that I saved them. Because the one thing I know is true, when you're going through something, everybody needs a good makeover, and your girl knows how to pass on a discount. <laughs> <laughs> so looking back, and Dominique from eBay, this one's for you. I now understand that my experience as an 11-year-old Avon lady was the first time I witnessed the power, the complexity, and the grace of a fully intersectional women's network. I told you I could stick the landing here. <laughs> and I've been thinking about this. It's not a generational thing. But right now, in sort of this miraculous time of all of this change, system change, Me Too, Time's Up, Movement for Black Lives, power networks, we're sharing information. I know it's not a perfect time. It seems to me that there's actually a chance for women to use our power and our voices to make things better for everyone. A fully intersectional sisterhood that challenges authority, challenges, holds gatekeepers accountable, and brings allies along with us. We're not there yet, and no metric of business life have we really achieved it um, on any of the list, boards and, and investment in executive ranks. But there are a thousand little cracks in ceilings high and low, and that's how the light gets in, right? So to help us explore this topic more, Vivian, I'm about to throw to you. We have three wonderful women who are working on this and thinking about this and noodling on this in very different ways. I'm going to ask Vivian Castillo, the Senior Design Research Salesforce, to start us off today. Welcome. Thank you. So I'm Vivian Castillo. I'm a senior design researcher and innovation consultant within Salesforce's Office of Innovation, where I basically work with our C-suite executives of our customers to help them be more human-centered, but also because uh, I'm a trained therapist who made a career switch into this, I often have conversations with executives about the things that get in the way of innovation. So things like fear of failure, shame, the written and unwritten rules of leadership, et cetera, et cetera. And as I was thinking about this town hall, um, you know, the reality is most of us can only handle so much truth in one sitting. <laughs> so I often couch my <laughs> difficult conversations with executives and stories. And so for this town hall, I couldn't help but think about the story that I had heard about how in the early 1900s, some psychiatric hospitals had a peculiar way of determining whether someone was sane enough to re-enter society. And so they would put someone in a room with a sink and they would plug the sink, turn on the water and wait for the water to splash over the edges and hit the floor. Then they would give them a mop and walk away and see what they would do. If the patient unplugged the sink, turned off the water and mopped up the water that had spilled onto the floor, they were deemed as ready to go back into society. But if the patient continued to frantically mop as water continued to splash on the floor, they were deemed as needing more time in the institution because they had failed to identify the problem. And so many of us in this room are probably frantically mopping. Hmm. The hyper-awareness of lack in a culture of scarcity at times can make that question of enough not only feel constant, but crippling. How much is enough influence? Do I have enough time? Do I have enough degrees, et cetera, et cetera? We deprioritize our emotional, relational, physical, mental, spiritual self-care. Um, and what that does is it impacts the quality of the work and the things that we have to offer the world and to others. And many of us want to be an ally, pride ourselves in being allies, and yet, the idea of leaning in deeper to that interpersonal work that's necessary to truly understand your privilege and learn how to not waste it, but yet leverage it on behalf of others can seem incredibly daunting. And so many of us have been, are currently, or might enter a season of frantically 
mopping. And so today, I don't want to hand you another mop, and I hope that we don't hand each other another mop. Um, but I want to just quickly touch on three potential ways that you can approach that plug so that you can be able to cause impact into the world. And so the first one, I would say, is to be vulnerable. If there's anything that I learned from yesterday is that being vulnerable and transparent it's probably one of the most inspiring and courageous things we could do. Mm. And to not avoid those opportunities, because a lot of times we try to avoid them by inserting humor, because it's uncomfortable. The second thing I would say is to embrace therapy and self-care. I really love uh, Jordan Peele's latest movie, Us. And when he was giving this interview, he was talking about this message that he hoped people would take away from it. And he talked about, you know, the things that we bury and try not to face affect the world that we try to make around us. And so in the most loving way possible for some of us in this room, it's, it's time to go to therapy. It's time to carve out that time. It's time to, to care for yourself so that you can truly put your best out into the world and help other people as well. And the third thing I would say is to check your privilege. And we all have privilege. You know, for me, I am a cis, hetero, educated, able-bodied, neurotypical American citizen. And I know that if I don't check my own privilege, then I might waste an opportunity to help others. I might waste an opportunity to bring others to sit around with me at the table and not just focus about my own seat and my own. And so... That's all I have for you today. Thank you. Thank you. Here's my favorite football star. <laughs> Sam Rappaport, Senior Director of Football Development, National Football League. Cracked the 40 under 40 list at Fortune this year. Thank you so much. We're going to have to keep raising that up and as you grow into your job. So we've got to invent 50 under 50, clearly, to <laughs> keep you in the loop. How, did this, how does this conversation hit your ear? Absolutely, and that was all thanks to you, Ellen, so I very much appreciate it. Hi, everyone, my name is Sam Rappaport. Uh, I work in the diversity, equity, and inclusion space in the National Football League. Uh, when I started there 17 years ago, there were zero female coaches on the sidelines, zero female scouts, zero female officials, and no women making decisions on the actual game that was going on on the field. And in my mind, how in the world was that possible when we boast that 45% of our fan base is female? This needed to be fixed, and I wanted to be one of the people leading the, the solutions. Uh, I'm personally obsessed with creating programming that creates meaningful societal change in this country, and I truly believe that my team and I have started to do that. Four years ago, we created a program that we host every year and it's called the NFL Women's Careers in Football Forum. We bring 50 women to the NFL Combine and we put them in organic situations with our NFL head coaches, our general managers, and our owners for two days to give them an opportunity to interact uh, in a casual setting with them to secure opportunities on the football field in the most traditionally male-held positions probably in the country. So this wasn't a traditional program. We didn't just host panels and breakout sessions. We, we created intentional strategic moves in the program to create uh, and pretty much guarantee results. And I don't have time to share all of them, but I thought I would share three quick uh, elements of our secret sauce. The first one was we had no NFL coaches, head coaches that had any females on their staff. But what we did was we identified the head coaches in the NFL who who expressed an interest in diversity, equity, inclusion, and we put them up on a stage and we asked them, why are there no females coaching in the NFL? What can we do to get more women coaching in the NFL? And these coaches are looking in the faces of 50 qualified women who could take those jobs. <laughs> so what did that do? <laughs> It cited action, right? They went back to their clubs, they, they, were, they were put on the spot at the NFL Combine, and they decided to make change, and, the, and our coaches started hiring female coaches. Wow. The second thing we did was we, we called them breakout sessions, but they weren't really breakout sessions. What we did was we told the head coaches, the owners, and the general managers that they were interviews, but we didn't tell the participants that. 
These are 20-year-old females that are starting out in their career that are sitting across the room from Ron Rivera, the head coach of the Panthers, or Kim Pagula, the owner of the Buffalo Bills. That is an incredibly intimidating situation, and we wanted to put them in a position to succeed. So the, the coaches and the owners and the, and the general managers interviewed them there, and so these women didn't even have to interview for jobs because they got them on the spot without even knowing it. Uh, the third one is we have one staff that's dedicated at our office solely to scouring the country to find the best 50 women, the best talent that we have in the country because we all know that when you are the first, you have to be the best and you have to be incredible and there's little room for error. So it's incredibly important for us to select those 50 and vet them uh, quite extensively. And the last one, the one that's the most close to my heart, is we mandate that 50% of our participants every year at minimum have to be women of color. And if, and if we cannot reach that, we're not hosting the program. What we learned through a lot of our research is that if you host gender programming wherever you are at your organization, it will be for white women unless you intentionally make it for women of color. And we are adamant and indignant about that point. So what was the result of that? We saw our first black female Division I college football coach this year, Jennifer King, at the University of Dartmouth. And we also had our first full-time black female scout, Sally Clavel, at the 49ers. Those are the Woo! results of being intentional with your, with your effort. So what were the overall results of the program over four years? 86 opportunities emerged out of that program. We now have 20 women who have been coaching in the NFL since that program started, four female scouts, uh, and 26 out of the 32 clubs that we have uh, now raised their hand to be a part of it. Um, we're, we're not looking for firsts, we're not looking for trailblazers, we're looking to create the norm, and you know that is how I am trying to fix the world in my own little way. Thank you. <laughs> And finally, we have Krish Omara Vignaraja. Did I say that correctly? President and CEO of Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Service to tell us how she sees this impacting the whole world. Um, so my name is Krish Omara Vignaraja. I was nine months old when my parents fled a civil war and came to this country. Um, they came with no jobs, just $200 in their pockets and two very young kids in their arms. Um, thank God that America welcomed us as it welcomed the tired, the poor, the huddled masses. Uh, my parents became public school teachers, which allowed them to send their daughter to Yale, Oxford, Yale Law School, and eventually to the White House, where I served as policy director to First Lady Michelle Obama. Yes. Yeah. Uh, First Lady. <laughs> By contrast to many of my White House colleagues, I had never worked on a campaign before. And I stress that because in many of the conversations I've had in the last 24 hours, a lot of people have talked about transitions. I had always worked on policy, not politics. Obviously, these are times like we've never seen before. So I launched my campaign for governor of Maryland, running as the only woman against eight men. Yeah. And as many people told me to wait my turn, as some older women told me to stay at home with my baby, I launched my campaign on my daughter's third month birthday, yeah. announcing as my first policy that I wanted to make Maryland the first state in the nation to guarantee three months of paid family leave. A few of you may have seen a campaign ad um, that I had where I was breastfeeding my baby girl. Yes. <laughs> well, that baby girl is now two and a half years old. And I know that my daughter's life will be easier because my own parents' lives were hard. And to me, that is the American dream. And it's very much at the heart of what I work on today as president and CEO of a national immigration nonprofit, Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Service. We operate through over 100 partners in 39 states across the country. We're working on everything from refugee resettlement to working through companies like Starbucks, Tyson's, Walmart to train refugees and immigrants to become skilled workers. So if you're looking for amazing, reliable workers, please see me. On the border, uh, we provide room, shelter, medical screenings, hygiene kits, 
um, diapers to children, families who are coming out of detention with literally nothing but the clothes on their backs. And so you, if you have things to give away, please see me. Um, we also have a particular expertise in child welfare. And so we were one of the two organizations that the government turned to as family separation became a crisis last summer. Today, I spend a bit of time telling members of Congress and the media, though the policy has ended, the practice continues. Just in the last eight months, we've had nearly 40 children, four under the age of one, who have come into our custody after being ripped from their parents' arms. Shocking, tragic. It's uh, been, as you can probably sense, um, uh, an exciting time, challenging time. I love being the head of what I feel like is an 80-year-old startup. I am slowly coming into um, kind of the comfort with my own, uh, in my own skin, but at a towering 5'2", I'm still trying to convince myself that it's okay to wear flats into business meetings. <laughs> but this is where I have lo I've learned to, to, to love and to leverage my identity and my experience as a woman, as a woman of color, as an immigrant, and a mom. And I'm really excited to kick off this conversation with you because I know together we will change the world because we must. The future is female, and that future is now. Aww. Okay, lights up. How, what do you need to change the world, your world? What questions do you have? What resources do you need? What comments do you have? This is your time. Oh, come on. <laughs> Bless you. Hi, thanks. Tell us your name. Hi, my name is Sarah Haggard. Um, okay, I'm the first one to put it out there, but I'm going to do it. So, um, I, gosh, okay. This is hard to ask for what you want. Maybe we should have a topic on that. Um, <laughs> so, I left Microsoft after 10 years and started my own company called Tribute. And, you know, Patty in the, the session on addiction was really interesting. Um, I actually lost my mom to addiction at 52. And... The whole premise of our product is that is to lead with personal storytelling in the workplace and to find mentorship and mentors in the workplace that have these shared life experiences and stories and things that you would never know one another with that lens, essentially. And so we've, I've created this product. We are working with Microsoft. I've worked for Kate and her team. We're working with several other companies. So I guess if I hadn't asked, it would be, you know, for the Cisco's and the Salesforce's and the PayPal's and the Ebay's, you know, and Twitter. I met so many companies, and I think that um, we see the future of work being a place where we have to think about our mental health. We have to support our employees in these new and interesting ways, and mentorship is a really powerful way to do that. So I guess my ask is, if this at all interests you, like, I'm an early stage startup, and we need to partner with more powerful women in this room to make this possible. Um, so I guess that's my ask slash, you know, come see me, come have a chat with me. I'd okay. love to tell you more. So, no, I, thank appreci you. I appreciate that. I appreciate kicking us off. Anybody have something similar or comments or anything? Feedback? Here we come. Here comes the mic. Yeah. Um, no, so I, I just have an ask. Um, so 78% of venture capital is spent in three states, all of them um, which are in coastal areas. Um, every time I think I introduce myself in this last two days and I say I'm from Oklahoma, I think I got you know one of those like, what? <laughs> um, and, and I think that um, you know right now we're so polarized in this country and I think that a lot of that has to do because a lot of the people in the middle of the country feel left out of the conversation, particularly as a lot of our traditional industries are dying out because right. of technology. Um, and I strongly believe that, that the problem is only going to get worse as automation and artificial intelligence continues to take over some of those industries. So for the venture capitalists in the room, um, I just encourage you to get in contact with me. I'll send you quality deal flow because there is quality deal flow in the middle of the country. And then I would just remind you that, you know, less than 1% of startups ever access um, venture capital, and that's because not everybody's building high growth companies. So we also need to come up with funding mechanisms that invest in women and people of color that are not necessarily tech ventures or high growth ventures. Hi. 
Thank oh. you. Hi, Claire Cormier Tilke um, with, with Heinz Real Estate. I live in Hong Kong. Um, so this is maybe a request slash a suggestion. So last year, there were a group of us that got fairly passionate about how do we keep the energy going and we struggled with, you know, we're all here because we're super, super busy and everybody's doing so well. So it's unrealistic to think maybe we could do task forces or committees around some of the issues that have come up, but we all want to do something. something. And so maybe building on what both of you beautiful women just said, is it that, you know, each of us in our industries, there are things that are very obvious to us that maybe others just don't know. So if you're in the middle of the country, it's very obvious to you that there are five things that a venture firm could do that would make a very big difference, not just to you, but to the entirety of your portion of the industry. Or if you're focused on climate change, there are five things very obvious to you that can be actionable right. for all of us. And so maybe it's that we somewhere, Google Spreadsheet, Slack, something contribute you know, here are some actions very relevant. And then, you know, on a coffee break, those of us can sort of scroll through them and maybe they're relevant. Maybe next time we're in a board meeting or next time something comes up related to investment or, I, I don't know. It seems like there's a there there that we could carry on. Like a top five, how to change the world from my point of view. And if we collect yes. a lot of them. But like actionable, like we can remember it. Right. We can absorb it on our own time and, you know, make the world just a little better because we each have a lot of power in our own areas. And so it's bringing that interse intersection. And it's an education and how other people actually understand and experience the world, too. Which right. Is nice. All right. And right here. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Hi, um, Kara Gustafson. So I was sitting at the same lunch table as I think it was Jordan and Sarah, um, which is kind of strange because three out of the 10 of us have lost someone to addiction in our life, sitting at one lunch table. Yeah. And so I lost my sister four years ago, and this is a real issue, and this is something that um, mental health is real. We need to start to change that conversation. Right. Um, and I think that we do need to connect with storytelling and not feeling alone and not feeling you know, ashamed that I when someone asks me, oh, you're the middle child, you know, having to explain my family dynamics. And so coming back to your point as well, I think it would be great to have a Slack channel or ongoing um, communication with one another, because whether it's something that's personal like this, um, that I'm sure the three of us <laughs> aren't the only ones, you know, if there's three people at one table, how many people in this room? Um, but also other things like job postings, board placements, I need strategic advice, how do I deal with this fundraising? I think that community and that connection to one another would be hugely, um, hugely valuable. Hi, no one knows me. Hey. Um, <laughs> it's my last time, I promise I'll leave the mic alone. <laughs> Won't bother any of you anymore. Um, what I would love for Fortune to do since we have this wonderful app and we have all these people in alignment with what has been said, give us an opportunity to say what our offer is, what our subject matter is, and what we need. And that way we can scroll through. So CNN just had their Heroes Award for the year. Um, and if you use the app, they have entertainment, business, government, we're all in one of those sectors. So we can click into entertainment or climate change or healthcare and say, okay. Here are the top ask. Here's the offers. Here's what I need. Then maybe we can just click it and offer that thing instantaneously. And then every year that you have the summit, we can capture how many solutions we've solved or right. what we've put together. And okay. so the next class can build on it. This is the second time you've all have done this too. <laughs> we really struggled last year to figure out a way to keep everyone connected, and we're going to get it this year. I promise. Hi. So my name is Lan Fan. I'm the head of membership and community at Fortune. So they actually brought me on. <laughs> so Alan Murray brought me on to actually solve for this problem. So we heard you. And I've actually been having these mini focus groups. And I've probably talked to at least two dozen of you. Yeah. Um, but I am here. 
I will give you my phone number, call me. What I really want to see is like- They will call you. Yes, no, seriously. <laughs> And I'm trying to partner actually with other communities as well. Like, so for example, the CMO of ZoomX is here. Why don't we do like a telechat with all of like, you know, the, the different participants. Um, but I really wanna think if you have like a, a company that would wanna kind of participate in terms of bringing community outside of these events, reach out to me. Um, I've spent the past um, 10 years uh, working with like building CMO communities, but also um, leading as a general manager of See Her, the gender equality initiative for the advertising industry. And we can actually change the world if we bring people together. And I feel like with these room of like powerful, amazing, kick-ass women, we can really change the world if we come together. And so my goal is to bring you guys together. Tell me how and what you want to see, because my, my job is just to execute on that. So hopefully we can answer that question and have some momentum after this. Yeah. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Lisa Harper. I'm with Edward Jones, I'm also a US Marine. And um, I've always been, in, thanks, thanks. Many of us have been in situations where the, we're the minority. And so I would love if there was a place where we could find the good. So maybe there are, um, I don't know, a space where we could highlight those that have really done wonderful things to help us. So for example, uh, the partner that invited me to Edward Jones and offered me a partnership, he took a risk on me. And right. I had never done anything in financial services. And so I want to highlight his story. I think good begets good. And sometimes in a world of scarcity and really unfortunate spaces, we forget to honor and highlight those that have lifted us up. It'd be really great if we could share those stories as well. OK, so the, this is like you're, you're saying that to identify people who took a risk, who were allies, who noticed who wasn't on the list and in the room, and make sure they get their moment in the sun too. Yeah, just to highlight how someone else made it possible for yeah. you to be where you are today. Okay. Like your mother or whoever it was that is your hero or that did that one thing. So that can be replicated and it can spread good, you know, like right. a ripple effect. Okay. <laughs> All right. We're getting a really good to-do list here, how to fix the world. And I feel like that acknowledgement is sort of a Sam Rappaport like power move. Like that's one of the things that really worked at the NFL is like making sure the people who were taking the risk were like getting the, <laughs> getting the attention for it. Hi everyone, Ali Levitan at General Assembly, uh, the education technology company, not the UN. Uh, just wanted to uh, <laughs> thank everyone for being in this room. It's so exciting and I feel like I've had um, so many people pay it forward for me to be here and want to kind of do um, the same. Uh, raise your hand if I've talked to you about my personal passion project called Code for Good this week. So a bunch, there's clearly a lot more people. So I usually um, ask people how I can help them and what value I can bring. I am so close to launching my passion project, um, which is all about reskilling existing non-tech female and underrepresented groups in existing enterprise firms uh, in non-tech roles into software engineers. We have one Fortune 500 company already signed on. I have five contracts outstanding, but I need three locked to launch this top of year. So I ask if that interests anybody in this room, if anyone is thinking about this, Please find me. I'm really, really excited about this. Um, I'm excited to change the world together. So thank you. Hi, everyone. My name's Laura Wang. I'm a management consultant for Insignium, based here in Southern California. Uh, my passion uh, is for underserved youth. Uh, I started a nonprofit with my husband earlier this year called Young Hustlers. Uh, we really want to instill that hustling mentality in uh, young kids, and uh, typically we're targeting 15 to 22 years old right now because they're in that critical stage of their lives, forming their personality, what they want to do in their lives. Um, so what we're doing is providing financial literacy education, um, how to invest, how to start saving, um, how, do, how does credit scores work, <laughs> things that high schools don't even teach right now, but are so crucial. Um, and um, also provide them exposure to all the types of career options that they could have um, that's not even uh, available to their knowledge. Um, so what we're doing is we're partnering with high schools and we're partnering with nonprofit organizations to go in and connect with the kids. Uh, we do want to develop this into a full spectrum, so uh, in a full life cycle. So getting them interested and then getting them uh, 
potentially mentorship opportunities or job shadowing opportunities, longer term scholarships for learning how to code. Uh, if they want to go into technology, they don't even have to do a four year degree anymore um, these days. So uh, really okay. this full spectrum service. Um, so. If you're interested in um, helping underserved youth, especially minorities, um, follow us on Instagram. It's called Young Hustlers Org, Young Hustlers Org, one word, and DM us, direct message us your email or whatever contact information you like. Uh, we'll keep you on our contact list and reach out to you if um, you have an interest in mentorship or just connecting with uh, these students. Thank you for Thank bringing you. your hustle here today. I appreciate that. So I have a more general question, and I'm sort of curious how you feel about it, is thinking about the state of the world today. You know, I'm hearing some big themes coming up. We need to be connected. We need to share the little pieces of the world that we know and understand together. We need to be caring about the, our mental health. And just to add on to your share, my sister is so sick with opioid and alcohol use disorder that I have to turn off my phone before I get on stage anytime because I just can't possibly see that call before I come and talk to everybody. So I'm with you and I understand all that too. Um, so I'm hearing all these priorities come up, but when you look at the state of the world, is, are there other things that we're not touching on that we should have on our radar screen, even if it's in our top five lists or just in our regular um, communications that we should be learning more about? Where are our blind spots? Should we, should we th be thinking about climate? Should we be thinking about refugees and migration? Should we be thinking about never-ending war? Like, I know these are big topics, but... Hi, I'm Vivian Nassam Odio with Johnson & Johnson. So I'll give you a couple that come to mind um, okay. since you're bringing that up. The first is that the maternal mortality rate in the U.S., especially for women of color, is now mimicking emerging countries. Right. Um, and that is a conversation that we're not having. And you know, when we talk about fertility as an industry, we're not also addressing the fact that as girls are growing, we spend all that time having them ignore their reproductive health and their organs and understand what that means for them long term. And by the time we open that door, there's a lot of health issues on the other side of that. And especially girls of color do not have the resources or the conversations to prevent some of the issues that they're facing. So living in a country that's mimicking emerging markets and women are dying at birth, yeah, I, know. I think that is something that we need to really be talking about and understanding what, it, what is the breaking point there. Um, so it's a passion for me. I'm, I'm not someone who's had children. I think when I hear that, I just you know want to cry. Um, and when I think about young girls of color also, um, a lot of passion for you know the idea that you can't be what you can't see. And so if anyone wants to stand together on that, I'm happy to partner. Along the lines of where you began this discussion, um, before my name is Neela Richardson, I work for Edward Jones. Before that, though, I started out in real estate. And I think a common thread in all the problems, if you want to list what we should be paying attention to, is where you live. It determines where you go to school. Right. It determines yeah. your access to fresh fruit. It determines your ability to get a job right. or an opportunity to play soccer to walk the streets without being f afraid of an attack, to play in a park without glass on the slides. Right. And so we don't talk about housing in this country. It's not considered a pocketbook voting issue, but it is the key differentiator in success of our children. So when we think about opportunity, we should think about just a house and a safe place to live mm -hmm. and what we can do as voters of as advocates to make sure that people, children, women, have safe communities where they can thrive. So just encourage you to remember the home. Thank you, thank you. We've got some back here and there. Hi, uh, my name is Heidi Nell. I'm a principal and head of impact entertainment at a public affairs firm called The Rabin Group and just became the executive director of a nonprofit called Good Films Impact. And we use stories and films to catalyze social change. And one thing that um, I'm working on right now and that I think everybody in this room can have a significant impact on and that I think as business leaders we need to be really sort of forward thinking about 
is um, the incarcerated population in the United States, okay. specifically returning citizens and the role that employment plays in decarceration. Um, and if anybody wants to talk to me about that, I'm happy to connect. We're leading a business summit on it in February. But, um, you know, this is a huge percentage of our population and the workforce and um, a meaningful percentage as well to put back to work. Thank you. Hi, my name is Ann Moses, and I'm the uh, founder and president of Ignite, which is a movement of young women who are ready and eager to become the next generation of political leaders. And when I think about all the issues that we're talking about here, housing, formerly incarcerated, maternal child birth and, you know, and mortality rates, they all have one thing in common, which is that these are policy issues that are determined by our elected officials. And um, the only sector that is... Uh, worse than women in office than government for women is actually women in the C-suite I think are faring worse than in political leadership and women in venture yeah. are faring even worse than that. Yeah. But if all the women, I, so I, I sort of have two things to say. One is Ignite is the largest and most diverse network of young women in the country who are actually aiming to become the next generation of political leaders and they're starting now. A lot of our women are running today. So for any companies in the room who are interested in partnering with a massive network of diverse Gen Z women who are going to run for office and going to be our country's next generation of leaders, please talk to me. Um, but more proximate and important is that we are heading into an election in 2020. Um, uh, women vote at 7% higher than men in every single demographic in the country, every single one of our demographics. Um, and there's an enormous opportunity to mobilize the next generation and frankly, our own generations of women to not just run but to vote. Um, I guarantee you that each and every one of you know 50 women who did not vote in 2018, who did not vote in 2016, and who may not vote in 2020. And if each of you commits to finding those 50 women and making sure they go to the polls, you can actually make a great deal of change in your communities. So. Right. Okay. okay. We have about a minute left. Good afternoon, my name is Caitlin Johnson from Cisco. One area that Cisco is focused on, and I'm not an expert at all, is homelessness. So I do think we need to start really focusing not only just on the mental health issue, but how it translates into homelessness. And it's hurting our environment, it's hurting our people, and it's hurting our communities. I don't have an answer, but I thought it'd be one subject to bring up because I haven't heard about it today. Oh, beautiful. So we are, we are almost out of time, I'd like to Throw it back down here. Vivian, do you have some inspiring words about maybe empathy or something to, to take us home? I mean, I guess when I'm hearing all the different themes in the room, uh, it's really hard to, to not talk about, you know, how can we change the world without having that conversation about institutionalized and systemic barriers to these opportunities and these things that we're talking about. And as we're talking about, you know, even things like the election, uh, and we're talking about women, we need to have that difficult conversation about how white women have been voting in the midterms and in the last election, and especially in some of these races that we've had. And so when I'm thinking about, you know, at a more like personal level of how we can start changing the world, it's about being able to be, to choose courage over comfort, to have some of these difficult conversations with our colleagues and our friends about the impact and the power behind their vote. And being able to have these conversations, too, about the impact that our businesses have, not only on politics, but the young girls who are looking up to us and are, you know, thinking about where they can go and thinking about, you know, the glass ceilings they can shatter. And um, I think there, we have a responsibility to, to really have these difficult conversations, especially how uncomfortable they can be. And so my encouragement is that you would start to lean in and do your own personal work and to check your privilege and to have these uncomfortable, challenging conversations, no matter how poorly they may go the first time, continue to lean into them because um, you know, people before us and the people looking after us, they really need it. So our town hall has now officially come to a close this year. I will miss you till next year. But I can promise you that we'll be working very hard behind the scenes to help cement a network that chooses courage over comfort and always pays attention to each other to amplify our voices and hopefully fix this broken world. Thank you. Thank you.